there was some at some point, but you did a lot with, you know, African-American guys and that kind of stuff. What's the biggest difference between maybe a black mafia family or black gang versus, you know, the Italian mafia, in your opinion, for all, you know, a lot of, we're very Italian OC centric. So I would like your point of view of what were the similarities and differences versus maybe, you know, a black mafia family. I think I think the biggest difference which 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 I always saw is that um the the Italian mafia it's more it's more like a machine you know the head gets cut off somebody else takes the place yeah where whereas the black organized crime it's more it's more you have these real charismatic leaders that everybody respects but then when they're gone so it kind of falls apart yeah so, yeah I mean that happens in the mob sometimes you know, it has happened. I'm not saying it never happens in the mob. It happens in the mob, you know, because yeah. you have all these, you know, wars and, 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 you know, I mean, just look at some of the groups like the, the Columbos and ever they have these big, you know, interfamily wars and stuff. But, you know, historically and traditionally, you know, one guy, the head is gone and, and someone, the next guy just steps up, Good point. you know, where, where with a lot of times the, the black organized crime, it's, it's all based on like one dude, yeah. like his influence, his charisma, you know, his ability to get everybody to move. Connections, yeah. Yeah, and, and a perfect example, I'm gonna, I'll show you the Supreme team. The Supreme yeah. team, it was Supreme. You know, Supreme was a guy. Yeah. As soon as Supreme was gone, you know, his nephew, Prince, you know, took the reins and it just changed. It just changed and, and then it was gone. So Jason wanted me to ask you, is Frank Matthews still alive? Um. I would like to think so. Yes, I would like to think he he's alive, man. I would like to think he got away with, uh, you know, that twenty million dollars in uh, nineteen seventy one. Which, you know, could you imagine how much is twenty million dollars from nineteen early nineteen seventies? How much that would be worth now? So, um, I, I would I would like to think, yeah, man, he he got away, you know. But um, I don't know. More realistically, I mean, if he had twenty million dollars, probably some mob dudes killed him and took that money and chopped it up, you know. And he's probably, you know in a barrel or got chopped up in a wood chipper and is in the Atlantic ocean. Well, I got to give him credit because he took on the mob when the mob was a mob. And, and I don't know, I, I don't know if you covered this in your books. I didn't read that particular yeah, book. street legends volume two. I got a chapter on Frank Matthews in street legends volume two. Can you maybe educate our, our maybe give the, the clip of the, the Seth notes version of who Frank Matthews was and kind of his, his arc. Yeah. So Frank Matthews was this big heroin dealer from uh, early 1970s you know, New York city. And, um, he was a dude like at first he was, he was actually, you know, cause the mob called, controlled all the heroin. So at first he was actually buying stuff, you know, through the mob, but eventually, you know, he, he was like, you know, why am I doing this? Cause he, he was, you know, he was felt like he was doing all the work and just handing them the money, you know, cause he was generating so much money. So he wanted a bigger cut of the pie. They wouldn't give him to him. So he actually went, and got his own connections, like through Corsica and started importing his own stuff, yeah. you know, through some people. Yeah. Through some people in Cuba. So, you know, not only is this dude, I mean, this dude was, was innovative, you know, but at, at that time, like, you know, you're talking early seventies, like, like the mob, I mean, I, I don't know if they were at their height, but they were still pretty up there. You know, I, I'd say probably by the eighties, you know, they, yeah. they were kind of falling off, but you know, in, in the, in the early seventies to the mid seventies, they, they were still like up there. They controlled a lot of stuff. You didn't cross them. And here you got this African-American drug Lord. Yeah. And he basically like he went down to Mulberry Street, Little Italy yeah. in New York one time with a bunch of cars, yeah. loaded all his guys up, loaded all guns. And he went down and paraded through there and said, if anybody got a problem with me or anybody messes with any of my people or any of my spots, I'm going to come down here and I'm going to shoot wow. everybody. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I think the mob dudes like they looked at this dude because he was not scared. You know, most people, yeah. you know, back then they were scared of the mob. They were shook. Right. And here was this black dude. He was not scared, man. He had like balls of steel yep. and uh, he was basically like, fuck you. I'm going to do what I want. And they kind of had to step back yeah. and, you know, and, and, and kind of work with him to an extent. But, you know, like I just said, maybe in the end, yeah. maybe they did get him because, you know, if he was going on the run, he might have had to try to, you know, rely on some of those assets you know, some of those resources, you know, right. that criminal network and organization that the mob has historically had, yeah. you know, to get away. And somebody could have betrayed him for that money. And maybe they betrayed him because they thought, you know, he he, he stepped out of line. Good point. Um, we're going to be wrapping up soon. Here are the questions I have a few. That no, I, did, I just want to get to White Boy Rick and how he actually got into the development part of it. Um, 
you know, we finished off with you writing back and forth and trying to get in contact with, and you finally did. But now let's fast forward, you know, when, you know, did you guys take it seriously and, and moving forward in your relationship? Yeah, so I, I, you know, when I finally, you know, got 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 his story like around, like I, I'm telling you, it took me like a good, you know, five six years to kind of frame that story because I was all like in the, the bang bang outlaw, you know, gangster stuff, and um, he didn't want his story portrayed like that because he was trying to get out of prison, and and anybody that's in prison, they don't want to be be tra- portrayed like that because that they're going to use that against them when they try to get out. So I was like, okay, I'm going to help this dude get out. So when I got out. You know what I'm saying? We kept writing. I kept doing pieces and um, I kept interviewing, you know, I, he would call me on the phone and I would interview him. And, um, you know, basically we got to the point where I had the story right and, and I, my, my writing had matured. I, I had matured as an adult, you know, where, where I didn't see things, you know, the same way I saw things, you know, the bigger picture instead of the smaller picture, you know, because whatever you can say, somebody's around, somebody's this and somebody. But really, in the big scheme of things, that's a smaller picture. I mean, the government's pulling all the fucking strings. You know what I'm saying? They're doing the manipulation. I mean, whatever. You know, and some people, you know, they shouldn't be in, in that line of work because